Hello friends, I'm Mohammed, and in today's video we're going to be setting up a local Kubernetes cluster on our machine. We're going to be building this Kubernetes cluster utilizing Minikube and we're going to be seeing how we can actually configure it locally on our machine. So let's get started. So in previous video we have discussed the structure of a Kubernetes cluster, we discussed the control plane, the worker node and how everything fits together and we have seen how our .NET application actually integrate with this. In today's video we're going to be discussing how an actual Kubernetes cluster works. So in this example here what we have is, so what we currently have here is a bare bone structure of a Kubernetes cluster. So we can see here we have a control plane, we have two worker nodes, the networking is already set up between them and usually this is going to be its own virtual machine. So this is going to be a VM. So this server is basically a VM and this is another VM and this is another VM. Um, so these could be running on an EC2 instance somewhere or basically a virtual machine on Azure and basically these are all configured to each with each other. This is a very simplistic and bare implementation and as we can see here if we're going to build something like this it's not easy for us to duplicate it on our local computer because it requires a lot of resources, it requires a lot of different configuration and it's not going to be as easy uh, to do so. So how can we actually have a Kubernetes cluster available on our own machine? That's going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to be utilizing Minikube. So Minikube in instance it is a virtualization technology that allows us to have a Kubernetes cluster available directly on our machine. Within this cluster instead of having three different servers in order for us one for as a control plane, one as a worker node, another one as a control and as a worker node, everything is bottled up into a single machine. Again this is for development purposes so it should be more than enough for us to actually experiment with and actually utilize. So in this example here we have our local computer and inside this local computer what we have is a VM running on this machine and within this virtual machine we actually have a Kubernetes cluster initiated through it and this cluster will contain a control plane and worker nodes that we can actually utilize. And within this control plane we have the full set of components that we expect from a control plane. So we're going to have a control manager, we have a scheduler, we have an ETCD and we have an API. We don't here have a, a cloud control manager because we're running it locally. If we want to connect it to the cloud, that's a different story. But now because we're running locally, we don't have a cloud control manager. So in order for us to have this ready, uh, available. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through the setup process that Kubernetes provide on their website. We're going to be following it step by step and then we're going to be able to see how we can actually set it up local on our machine. Something that I would like to point here is as you can see here that we have kubectl is connected to API. So before we actually get started, I just want to explain what is kubectl. kubectl basically is the command line interface that we can actually utilize to combinate with the Kubernetes. So basically the kubectl allows us to directly communicate with the control plane APIs and it will allow us to manage it from there. Currently what we're going to be doing is because we're going to be running it locally, we don't really have to go through all of the different authentication and authorization because everything is running local. But the same kubectl commands that we're going to be actually exploring are the same that we utilize whenever we're using a Kubernetes cluster which is exists on the cloud or it has its different implementation on different virtual machines. So kubectl here as we can see it allows us to communicate with the cluster it's also the same way that we are actually communicate with any Kubernetes instance, whatever it is available. So the stuff that we're going to be learning within kubectl is going to be applied everywhere. So now that we have understood how everything is going to be working, let us go to the documentation and see how we can actually follow this. So here what we have, I'm going to link this also page in the description down below. What we have is the Minikube start guide. So once you go there, it's going to give you the capability. First of all, it's going to give you the requirements that you're going to be needing in order for you to run Minikube on your machine. And it's a pretty bare bone requirement for today's standards of the machine. So we can see it requires 2 GB of RAM, 20 GB uh, storage space, an internet connection to CPU, which is pretty straightforward. Also, it requires Docker. So it, I highly recommend you having Docker installed on your machine. And basically, once you have that, it's going to take you to an installation page. So here, what you're going to do is based on your current machine. So either, for example, you want to utilize you have a Linux, you have Windows, you have Mac OS. So you choose whatever operating system. In my case, I have a Mac OS. Then it gives me the architecture. Is it Intel based or Apple Silicon based? Also ARM64. In my case, it's going to be ARM64. It's going to give me the release type. Currently, there's only a stable one. And then it's going to give me the capability to choose if I want to download binary or if I want to utilize basically through Homebrew. And both of them are valid enough. Just to make it simple enough, what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize the link. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy these links and I'm going to go to my terminal and I'm gonna paste the commands here and let it run. So what's gonna happen right now, it's gonna download all of the requirement from Minikube from those websites. So it's gonna go to storage to go to APIs, it's gonna download the latest version of Minikube and then it's gonna install it for me. 
So this will take uh, a bit of time, so I'm just gonna leave it. And once it finished, uh, we're gonna be continuing. Okay, so now that the download has complete, it's gonna ask me to put my password. So I'm just gonna add my password. And now we can see that once this installation has completed, I'm able to actually to actually start installing it. So what we have done right now is just we have installed, uh, downloaded the repositories or basically the packages, and we have given it the minimal uh, installation that needed in order for it to run. So now if I type cube. CTL, we can actually see that we can actually start utilizing kubectl with this because we are the package have already been installed by utilizing the install command as we can see here which is installing minikube darwin arm 64 etc etc so i'm just going to clear up my screen right now and i'm going to actually start by having my minikube instance installed if we go back to my documentation we'll be able to see that once we have finished we can actually just type minikube start and this will actually do all of the required for us to have a minikube version available so if you come back here put minikube start let it run we can see here that minikube is version 1.3.1 is actually running right now on our machine and what it's doing at this moment is actually downloading all of the different kubernetes configurations so what's going to do right now it's going to actually initiate a virtual machine on my computer it's going to download all of the different packages that kubernetes will need so the first step that we have done is we have installed minikube and minikube now will manage the kubernetes cluster available on our, our machine and what it's doing is downloading all of the different packages that Kubernetes is going to be needing. It's going to download some Docker images. It's going to download a few different configuration items, and then it's going to set it up all for me. So the process right now is simply trying to set up all of this. So the first step was actually having Minikube available, which we have done. Let's just copy this and put here Minikube. And then once Minikube is set up, then we're going to have our Kubernetes cluster. Let's change this color to yellow, for example. And now what we're going to be doing here, you're just going to have to wait until the Kubernetes version is downloaded. And as we can see, it's downloading version 1.30. So let's just give it a bit of time and once this is done we'll be able to see the kubernetes version available or basically the kubernetes cluster is up and running so now that the installation has completed successfully let's see what's happened here so as we can see here that once the main once the main download has been completed we have a docker container which has been installed and within this docker container if we type docker ps we'll be able to see that we have a kubernetes cluster available so we have kube controller we have the api server we have the scheduler and we have other supported or supportive functionality available for us directly through the controller itself. So let's go back up and check what else has been available. So we can see here that on top of the containers, we have some certificates and keys, and that's basically is utilized to authenticate between the controllers and the worker nodes. We have some kind of a RPAC rule implemented, and we can see the control plane is already up and running. So once we have done all of that, we can see here that now we are utilizing Minikube version number five, and it's all available on our machine. And the main item here, we can see that kubectl, which is our main way to communicate with our Kubernetes cluster, is already automatically configured to utilize utilize minikube as a default namespace and what that means is in case we have a different kubernetes instance connected to our machine so we have one on the cloud one on on-prem for example and one within minikube we can actually specify to which environment we want to talk to and now we can see that because we are using the kubernetes cli which is kubectl it's already configured to talk with minikube so we don't really have to worry about all of this configuration clear this up and now what we want to do we want to just experiment so we want if we type kubectl we can see here now we have all of those different conf uh, requests that we can actually see and we can basically create we can run we can set all of those different items that we currently utilize within kubectl if we want to utilize minikube as well so we can put min let's clear this again and let's put minikube and if we type minikube also we can see all of the different commands that we can actually utilize with minikube in order for us to get started with it so now that this is done and we know that both of them are running and both of them are available through our terminal to communicate with what we want to do is we want to actually start our minikube instance so all i'm going to do is type minikube start and we already have done this before but now every time we want to start it make sure it's updated we can see right now it's going to do the same thing again although i started a bit ago but i just wanted to make sure that in case there's anything has changed usually there isn't but in case there anything has changed i'll be able to see it here populating and now we can see that everything is started and it's just going to give it a few more seconds and we can see everything is running so now that my minikube is already starting what i want to do is i'm going to start experimenting with some of the kubectl so i'm just going to type kubectl get nodes and right now we can see that all the only node that i have is my control plane so if we go back here to my diagram we can see right now that within kubectl what i have what we have is we have only the control plane available and this control plane will have the api manager the scheduler the control manager and the etcd so we don't really have any worker nodes because we have not specified any currently working nodes all we have is a control plane available for us and as we can see with the kubectl we are able to communicate with the control plane and basically ask it whatever questions that we want so let's see what else we can do so i'm gonna utilize kubectl 
I'm gonna set get services. And now we can see here that I have my Kubernetes service also available within my kubectl. We can see what is the internal port that it's running. We can see it's running through HTTPS and we can see the age of that service since it's been up on locally on my machine. Now, if I wanna actually specify or check what is the version of my kubectl uh, that is running, let me clear this up. I have to put kubectl version. And now we can see here that I have my kubectl version, I have my customization version, which is my Kubernetes version, as well as my server version. Whenever there's a major update, we can see these are gonna be updated to reflect those. And if you're following some kind of a tutorial, make sure that those versions are actually matching because the different commands can break based on the different versions. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna actually create a deployment. So what do I mean by that? So in order for me to have a worker node available up and running, what I wanna do is I wanna create a deployment. So currently, we cannot create a pod manually. We cannot create a worker node manually we cannot create a queue proxy manually what we want to do is and we can see here what we want to do is i want to create a deployment and we're going to go through this process in a bit more detail but basically whenever i'm creating a deployment basically i'm sending a request to my control plane i'm telling it please create for me a resource that i'm going to be utilizing so whenever control plane receives this what is gonna happen? Based on my deployment request, and right now we're gonna be having a very simple deployment, which is gonna be only an Nginx server. Uh, in the future videos, we're gonna be seeing how we can create a deployment based on our .NET application, but for now, just because we are getting started, we're gonna be making it very simple. So within that deployment, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be telling Kubernetes that we, have, we want this resource to be available. So Kubernetes will take our command, and then what it's gonna do is gonna be creating a replica set. So based on the command that we have provided, what it's gonna be doing is, is gonna be creating the actual worker nodes. And within those worker nodes, it's gonna specify the number of pods that it is gonna be creating. So as soon as I create a deployment, Kubernetes will understand that a new worker node will be populated. So that's the first item. Then once a worker node is populated, based on the deployment that I have requested of Kubernetes, what it's gonna do is gonna create a pod. And within these pods, it's gonna create a different replica set. So if I specify I'm only gonna have one single worker node and only one pod within my replica set, because that's the default one, it's gonna only create one. If I specify inside my deployment that I wanna have five replica set, it will create five for me. So all of this is gonna be automatically managed within Kubernetes. I don't have to worry about how replica sets are created. I don't have to worry about their networking. I don't have to worry about their configuration, their resource allocation their internal proxies, internal uh, routing. I don't have to worry any ab uh, about that. All I have to worry about is specify the right deployment process so, so Kubernetes will take it from, the, from there. And we're gonna be seeing how easy it is right from the CLI to actually get a like, deployment up and running. When it comes to deploying an application, it's gonna get a bit more complicated than that. But from a CLI point of view, we're gonna be seeing how, we can, how easy it is to jump start and actually seeing something in action. So once we have told Kubernetes that it needs to do a deployment and automatically a replica set will be created for us based on the configuration, and because we're doing a default one, it's gonna create a default replica set, which is gonna be one. Once a replica set has created, then it will move to creating the pods. So at first it will create the worker nodes, and then it will create the pods that we need in order for us to run our resources. And once the pods are initiated, then it will containerize our resource and it will store them inside the pods. So it, the deployments get started, the replica set are initiated by Kubernetes, which means the, the worker nodes, and then the pods inside those worker nodes are initiated. And then because we rely on containers, it's gonna initialize the Docker daemon, or if we're using Podman, and then from there, the container will run. So this is gonna be the process that Kubernetes will follow whenever we're trying to do a deployment. So now that we have understood the theory of a deployment and how we can actually get something running, so this this flow does not only work with Minikube, it works with every single Kubernetes deployment that we do. It's either on AWS, Azure, on-prem, custom one, homemade one, whatever it is, this is, the flow, this is the flow that's gonna happen within Kubernetes. So now we understand this full flow. Let's see how we can actually create a very simple deployment for an Nginx. So if you go back here to my terminal, I'm gonna type kubectl create deployment. I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna call it Nginx dev. And I'm gonna specify the Docker image that I wanna use. If I have my own application available somewhere, I can use that. But for now, for simplicity's sake, I'm using an Nginx publicly available Docker image on Docker Hub. So I put image equal Nginx. And now if I click on enter, we can see a deployment has been created. So if I put kubectl get deployment, click on enter, we can see here that I have a deployment which is in the pipeline. We can see it's not ready yet. We can see that its target is one and nothing is available. If I run this again, we can see it's also still ready because what it's doing is setting up my worker nodes, Creating my, my, creating my replicas at first, then setting up my working node, initializing the containers inside those 
worker nodes and then I'm able to actually get it running. So now if we take a look at that, we can see it's still pending. Usually it takes like roughly a minute depending on the size of the container and the resources available on your machine. So if we give this a bit of time, we can see it's still going. So while this is still going on, we want to check different something. We want to check a different item within kubectl. So if I type kubectl get pods, now we can see that we have our pod is running, which is other than the control plane. We can see now we have our Nginx development. We can see now we have a random allocated ID. And within this, we are able to see that my kubectl is running. So if I now go back and get deployment, we can see now my deployment has been completed successfully. It is up to date and now it's available for me to utilize. So let's clear this up again and let's go back to that command. So within get deployment, we can see that the deployment has completed successfully. You can see that we have one instance of that deployment and it's available for us to use and we can see its age is roughly 93 seconds. If I want to check the pods, again, I can put kubectl, get pods. And basically what we're doing here is we're going, the request is going from our CLI to the control plane. From the control plane, it will go to the actual worker node. So that's the flow that it's going to follow. So here we can see that when we put this, we can see that the pods are currently available, which means that my request came, first of all, from kubectl. So that's going to be the first one. And let's make this a bit bigger and let's make it red. So actually, let's make it yellow. So it came from here. Then it went to our API server, then from our API server, then it went to the worker node, and then we got the information back. So this is how the flow currently works. So right now, when we put get our pods, which basically we went in and we told to check how many pods inside a worker node, and we only have one, and that's how it works. Now, if I type kubectl, get replica set, all one word, we can see here that inside my replica set, we have my desired state is one, my current state is one, and ready to be utilization is one. So we can see even my replica set ID, which is going to be 588, 568, etc., actually match exactly the ID that my pods are actually using, because they match with each other, because they live inside the same worker node. And basically, every single pod now have its own additional extra ID. So the first part of the ID will match to the replica set. And then for every single additional pod that if I want to, I can actually have an additional ID attached to this. And this is how easy it is to have a Kubernetes clusters available on our machine in order for us to start experimenting and building. So now that we have covered the main process of having a Kubernetes cluster available on our machine, within the next video, we're going to be seeing how we can actually deploy our .NET application to our local Kubernetes cluster. We're going to be seeing how we can actually configure it so we can actually communicate with it, have different replica sets, have different pods, etc, etc, all through that process itself. If you like this video, please like, share and subscribe. It will really help the channel. As well, if you'd like to support me, please consider supporting me on Patreon or buy me a coffee. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a great day.